Welcome to the Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, and I'm your host, Eugene Borohovich. I thoroughly enjoy bringing you discussions with incredible industry leaders in every episode, and it would mean a lot to me if you could rate the podcast in your favorite player and hit that bell to be notified of future episodes. If you've been keeping up with the news, you know that GLP-1s took over the headlines when it comes to cost containment of payers. Seems like every week we hear about another health plan or employer speaking about the increase in spend and the demand is outpacing the supply. Better Therapeutics announced last week that they commercially launched its AspireX Digital Diabetes Therapeutics app. We had the pleasure of having Mark Berman on this podcast in June of last year, and while a lot has transpired in the company since then, we thought it was a good time to refresh everyone's memory on lifestyle therapeutics, and yes, health coaching are also part of the equation. Enjoy the replay episode. Dr. Berman, welcome to the DTX podcast. Excited to have you here. And for our audience and listeners, would love to get to know you a little bit and understand how you came into digital therapeutics, a little bit about your background. And one key thing, because we do want to know the players and trailblazers behind the logos driving this, an interesting fact about yourself. Well, thank you, Eugene. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to talk to you today. As you said, I'm Mark Berman. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Better Therapeutics. By background, I'm a physician actually trained as a primary care provider with a longstanding interest in both technology and how it intersects with the use of lifestyle as medicine. One thing about me is that I never really set out to be a tech-related entrepreneur. I trained in physical therapy prior to going to medical school I was really always interested in the low-tech or the non-tech parts of medicine. How do you use food and lifestyle change as medicine, for example? So it's been a bit of a journey to find myself here working at the intersection of technology and many of those factors. And don't forget about an interesting fact, even though by itself was interesting, but if there's anything that stands out for our listeners to get to know you? Some would consider it interesting, some perhaps not, but... Uh, I have spent many a years here in America. I was actually born elsewhere. I was born in South Africa, grew up in Canada, lived in many countries. So I've had the benefit of seeing other medical systems in play, but obviously thrilled to be applying my life experience and so on to work here. So the interesting fact is that you're a global citizen, and I will not ask you which system you like better at the moment. Well, maybe we'll save that for later. Let's dive right into BetterTX. I know the company started in around 2015, I think even with a name called Farewell. So wanted to understand a little bit, you know, I'm connected with Kevin as well as one of the founders. Maybe give us a little bit of what was the prompt to start Farewell at the time, some of the name changing, but give us a little bit of a story and history of Better. So Better Therapeutics was founded in, as you say, 2015 by Kevin Applebaum and David Perry. And at the time, they were motivated by the idea that there was really decades of evidence at that point that you could make a compelling impact in people's lives and and address cardiometabolic conditions through the use of substantive behavioral changes. But despite the fact that that knowledge was published evidence for decades, it was not scaling. It was not going anywhere. There are millions and millions of people who were in need, millions more who are being diagnosed every year. The cardiometabolic epidemics that we have nationally and internationally are getting worse despite that. And so they saw a real opportunity to try to apply that knowledge and to use technology in a way to scale you know, what is known into effective solutions. At the time, as you mentioned, the company was called Farewell. It was a well-intended name, no pun intended, but it was confusing. It didn't convey the direction of the company that we were building digital therapeutics. We're often confused for a wellness company. And so we decided to find a new name that spoke both to our intent in therapeutics and to the overall aspiration, you know, to do good for as many people as possible and to help us make their lives better. Good choice on changing that because to me, farewell is a goodbye and I don't know if you want to... Yes, this is what we heard many times. It was clearly not the intent. Understood, totally. 
I'd love to, for the listeners, and we do have many that are outside of our healthcare system and the digital health aficionados, we do have patients listening to this podcast as well. If you can describe the actual patient experience on your product and actually what is it that you guys do? And I know there's multitude, but there's one in progress, which we'll get into. What we've done is we have uh, digitized a form of cognitive behavioral therapy and Cognitive behavioral therapy is really the gold standard evidence-based form of therapy that's been used since the 1960s as a way of helping patients make lasting behavioral changes. And typically, the way CBT is delivered is either in a one-on-one or group experience. And it's a conversational type of therapy, but it's different from what most people think of as therapy. It's time-limited. It is something that is only done intensely for a matter of weeks, not for years. And it's a process that's designed to help the brain change the way it's structured, to help basically capitalize on the understanding that every behavior that we have is learned and that we have behavioral dysfunction typically arising from core beliefs that are erroneous or or unhelpful. And so the idea of CBT is to help people change some of those core beliefs, which then directly influence what we do on a day-to-day basis. So by putting that methodology into a digital experience, into an app, one that is prescribed by a physician and downloaded on the patient's smartphone, we've taken an experience which is known to be effective, but is not accessible for the vast majority of patients and allowed patients to have a therapeutic experience where they do many of the same methodologies in CBT They have, in effect, a therapeutic lesson once a week, and those lessons are attached to relative skills, skill building exercise that help them apply new ideas that they gained in exploring that lesson in an interactive way. And they set goals on a weekly basis to make sure that behaviors are advancing to a therapeutic degree. The athletic experience versus an in-person or group experience is that in an app, you have that accessible whenever you want. You get to go at your own pace. You can engage instead of having to take an hour or two out of your day to engage, you can engage in a matter of minutes on a daily basis. And you have the resources and personalized feedback that is afforded by artificial intelligence to make sure that you are progressing and changing behaviors in a way that that works for you, that is going to be long-lived and that will be uh, therapeutic. As we're talking about cardiometabolic and diabetes specifically, I mean, it's very, very crowded space. And CBT, to your point, has been around. There are many companies that are digitizing the CBTs. But something that I read about you guys, it's the nutritional CBT. Can you talk a little bit about, again, your differentiation in the market and the nutritional CBT, if that's even part of that differentiation? I think you're right. Diabetes is a crowded space, and for good reason, given the extent of the epidemic and the costs and the burden associated with diabetes, many, many people are interested in making an impact. And it's also been well appreciated for the last two decades, at least, that you could apply CBT to cardiometabolic conditions like diabetes. But we have taken a step further in a few ways. I think one is that the general concepts of CBTs, you have to keep in mind that CBT was originally invented to deal with conditions like PTSD, anxiety, depression. And while these are core components to many patients who have type 2 diabetes, the original intent of CBT wasn't to address nutritional or eating and other lifestyle behaviors. So we have thought that it is critical to advance CBT. We've created our own variant of CBT that we've been working on for the past five or six years. And we call it nutritional CBT because while we're grounded in many of the first principles of modern day CBT, we've really spent our effort applying those principles to the ideas that drive eating behaviors in particular. One of the challenges in the diabetes space, both in terms of pharma and other tech solutions, is that the vast majority of these are not addressing the root causes of the condition. The root cause of type 2 diabetes, while of course there is a genetic predisposition in many, is a behavioral cause. And if we are going to make a difference in the lives of patients, if we're going to have an impact that is lasting, we can't just keep treating the symptoms and manifestations of conditions like diabetes. We have to treat the root causes. And so our attempt is to build a variant of CBT that is specific not only to diabetes or the condition that we're applying it to, but is also specific to those root behaviors 
mostly diet and of course exercise and other supportive lifestyle behaviors as well. And obviously you guys are pursuing PDTs, prescription digital therapies. What was the early decision and thinking about going the prescription route, which has its own challenges, which I'm sure we'll touch on later on, versus lifestyle, download, self-paced digital therapy, but just not a prescription? When we thought about this problem, you know, how do you address the root causes in patients? How do you apply technology to deliver CBT at scale? I think what we realize is that where the unmet need is, is really a gap within clinical care. And I saw this as a practitioner as well, that in clinic, all the docs and providers are well aware of the guidelines. Guidelines have been saying for decades that we need to emphasize behavioral change, that we need to help facilitate this and support this in our patients. But we have no tools. We have limited ability to refer patients to effective forms of behavioral therapy. And there's nothing standardized and prescribable. And that this was a gap because it is clear when you practice medicine, whether in this country or other countries, that the medical system itself is not going to be able to afford the time, the reimbursement, the training for providers to be able to facilitate behavior change. But providers have to follow the guidelines and have to offer something to their patients. And, and right now, they're just simply not. They're just you know, skipping that and going to the prescription pad. So where we saw the opportunity and the unmet need was a prescribable solution that providers could offer their patients. That was the first driving force. The second is that from a clinical perspective, we think that there is more merit to offering a solution that fits within the care paradigm as opposed to lives outside of it. Because behavioral therapy can be powerful medicine, and you don't want a situation where medicines are being prescribed in an uncoordinated fashion, self-prescribed by multiple providers. That doesn't afford the best care for patients. So we want providers to be aware of all the therapies that they are providing, have control over that so that they can make adjustments. And we also know that when behavioral therapy is effective, it requires medication adjustments. So to be able to close that loop, you really requires starting from a prescription and then being able to give feedback to providers and patients when, for example, medications need to be adjusted. So net, we saw lots of advantages in the prescription route, and we saw an unmet needed to be filled. Absolutely. And I think this is always a tough decision to make for the entrepreneurs because it may take longer and the routes to market and the commercialization, but it's got its own benefits as well. And actually, let's talk about that evidence generation that's needed in order to go prescription. If you can talk a little bit about the journey you guys are taking and if there's any updates that you're able to speak on the BT001 and the Pivoted trial and how you guys approach the evidence generation in this digitized world. It's a great question and there's many parts to answer that. I think the first is that we see evidence generation as a key part of what we do. And it is one differentiator because as you mentioned, this is a very crowded space and the vast majority of digital solutions that are out there just simply don't have robust evidence base. So you have a situation where patients are exposed to thousands of apps. Doctors also ask questions about what app to recommend and there's simply no evidence. So doctors simply have to stay out of the equation. So we have thought it's critical to have a robust set of evidence to be an evidence-based therapy because patients and providers need to have evidence what they're going to use is effective and safe. Secondly, in order to be prescribed, as you mentioned, there is a high evidence bar. You know, if we're going to be a regulated therapy, we have to be subject to the same evidence standards as other regulated therapies. We've been spending a lot of our energies and our capital and time going down that evidence generation pathway, first in feasibility or cohort type studies to generate proof of concept, proof of initial efficacy, and then in more robust, pivotal, uh, randomized control trials. And we were very pleased to announce the primary endpoint results of our first uh, pivotal trial in a product that we internally call BT001. It's the first application of our nutritional CBT for patients with uncontrolled type 2 diabetes. And we conducted a large multi-site, multi-state, open-label, randomized control trial where we enrolled 669 patients. These were patients who all had type 2 diabetes that was not controlled despite being on multiple medications. As it turned out, this was a nationally representative sample of patients, and it was quite a diverse patient population. We had 
about 40% of patients who are non-white, we had 40% who did not have a college degree. Many of these patients lived in low socioeconomic neighborhoods. And we tested the efficacy and safety of BT001 paired with standard of care compared to standard of care alone. We were looking primarily at blood sugar control as measured by a test called hemoglobin A1C, which looks at your average blood sugar over the past two to three months. And what we found in 90 days of use was an average reduction of 0.4% in the BT00 group relative to the standard of care. So that's a, both a clinically meaningful and it was a highly statistically significant difference. And is that the length of the program, the three months? 12 weeks on CBT? It's designed as a 90-day repeatable experience. Our thesis is that some patients will only need one prescription. Other patients will benefit from additional 90-day cycles. In this study, we tested the effect of two back-to-back -back treatment cycles. So 90-day endpoint allows us to understand what's the impact of the first treatment cycle. And this is an ongoing study, and it will conclude shortly where we'll look at the impact after two treatment cycles, so 180 days of use. I can share a little bit more about some of the other findings. We not only saw this clinically meaningful difference on average, but we saw a much higher proportion in the BT001 group that achieved that clinically meaningful threshold of 0.4% A1C reduction. So we saw about 45% of the BT001 group after 90 days versus 27% in the standard of care. And the average reduction in those responders was about 1.1%, so a very meaningful change. An RCT that's looking at efficacy and safety, it's not good enough just to stop there. We have to understand the safety profile. And we were pleased to learn that there were no adverse events that were linked to use of the app. And we also had, in fact, fewer serious adverse events in the BT001 group. And so as we sum that up, we see a strong and compelling signal of efficacy and a very good safety profile. The last finding that I think we found very noteworthy was that there's also a clear dose response relationship, that we didn't mandate everyone use the app in a specific way. We let patients use the app as they would in a more real world setting and observed what would happen. And we found very clear evidence that when patients engaged more in the use more therapy lessons, that they had a better response, a more significant A1C reduction. Yeah, it always fascinates me the term dose as an ingesting software, <laughs> but those are the topics in the digital therapy world. There's still dosage, which we'll get to prescriptions and all of that down the line a little bit. We're going to take a quick break and be right back with Dr. Mark Berman, Chief Medical Officer at Better Therapeutics. So this is BT001. If you can talk to other indications that you're working on, we're working on a few because you know the underlying mechanism of action, nutritional CBT, again, because it's attempting to address the roots, behavioral roots that are common to type 2 diabetes. These are also the same common roots that impact a multitude of cardiometabolic conditions. So we are working on conditions that share those underlying roots and mechanism of action. In particular, right now, we're focused on hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Those will be our next set of pivotal trials that we'll be running. And we've just launched a feasibility study in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as well. Well, that sound means it's time for a question from my clinical and commercial partner on this podcast, Chandana Fitzgerald, who is the Chief Medical Officer and General Manager of Health Excel and as her friends call her Dr. No Crack. Let's see what question Chandana has for our guest today. Hi, Dr. Berman. My question for you is, how do you decide on what the next prescription digital therapeutic in your product pipeline should be? Thanks, Chandana. This is a question that we think about a lot at Better Therapeutics, and there's a few factors that go into our decision-making. One is how can we best leverage the platform that we've built? So we are looking to address conditions that have similar pathophysiology, if you will, or certain similar underlying root causes, because the core of the behavioral therapy that we've generated is going to address a common set of behavioral roots. 
So we think about is the condition or the indication sharing in those behavioral roots, such as hyperlipidemia and hypertension, fatty liver disease. These are all conditions which we think are going to be responsive to behavioral therapy. And we think about also in terms of how much modification of the platform is there going to be in order to bring that PDT to market. The beauty of this platform is that we don't anticipate a, a large amount of modification is needed for a very broad array of cardiometabolic conditions. And so that also doesn't solve the question that you just asked. That, you know, we have to look beyond that and also think about the unmet needs. What are the conditions that are out there where patients and providers are really struggling to see improvement, where there aren't either behavioral therapies available or there aren't any therapies at all, for example, in the case of NASH and NAFLT? And what's the overall impact of those conditions at a population level from a, both a patient burden and a cost perspective? We fundamentally weigh all those factors into a matrix and kind of go from there. And I'm going to hop in because you said the word cost. And of course, while the platform can be leveraged, the, probably the bulk of the cost, the higher costs are in actually running these clinical trials, probably in millions per. So I'm not going to beat around the bush, right? I think you guys were first, maybe, I think first, but correct me if I'm wrong, digital therapeutic company to go public. So I'd love to understand a little bit about the decision to go public and then even more specifically around spacking out versus regular IPO. Happy to chime in on that. You know, usually as a chief medical officer, usually <laughs> not my area of expertise. Forte, yes, understood. But that being said, from very early days at Better Therapeutics, we have been committed to evidence generation. And as you rightly said, evidence generation is not easy and it is costly and it requires serious capital investment to bring prescription digital therapeutic to market because of that evidence generation and the time that it takes and the cost. And so in order to bring not one, but a whole suite of digital therapeutics to market, we knew that our capital needs initially would be high, that there would be time that would be needed to go through the regulatory process before we could have a product that we could legally commercialize. And so we saw a great opportunity in the public markets to fund that R&D and then ultimately the commercialization that is going to be necessary to bring a PDT to market because it will be capital intensive also to educate providers on a new therapy. It'll be capital intensive to help support the infrastructure that will be needed to prescribe digital therapeutics. And at the time we were looking at the options, whether private or traditional IPO or a SPAC, at the time was an attractive way to get there quickly. We understand the importance of speed to market and the SPAC vehicle was just an attractive one to move quickly there. So that's probably the limits of my explanation there. That was pretty good. As the chief medical officer, that was a very good answer. So I appreciate you taking uh, this question as well. But let's think again, probably not in kind of your forte, as I mentioned before, but love to understand, I know you guys are pre-commercial still, but I'd love to understand a little bit and to the extent that you can disclose how you guys are thinking about the pricing once you're commercializing, uh, and especially as you mentioned, right, there's a prescription for, let's say, 90 days. And how does that compare to some of the cost of the drugs for diabetes and for BT001 today as an alternative? We intend to price BT001 at a discount to branded pharmaceuticals. You hit upon two elements that I think are really important. I think one is that the payers and patients are struggling with cost. Uh, in order to bring another therapy to the market, it's critical that we have a competitive cost. So we do intend to price at a discount, even though from an efficacy standpoint, many patients will receive efficacy that is comparable to a pharmaceutical. The thing that's exciting to me, again, as a chief medical officer, is the time-limited nature of this therapy. Unlike a drug, this is not a form of therapy that we intend to be prescribed for life. So as we're modeling out our predictions, we are not modeling the idea that patients will be prescribed for the rest of their lives. In fact, a very limited number of prescriptions will be needed on average. And so if you think of total costs, whether it's over a year or over multiple years, 
We think that this will be very attractive to both patients and to payers and health systems because the total cost uh, relative to the chronic cost of expensive pharmaceuticals will be you know, significantly discounted. In the earlier discussion, you touched on that it will be costly to educate the prescribers and kind of the ecosystem of that. As a doctor yourself, how are you looking at actually convincing prescribing physicians? Because today, as a doctor, you prescribe a script that goes into a pharmacy, a pharmacist is in the front line, dispenses the drug. Now there could be all kinds of questions around, well, how do you use the app and et cetera. So we'd love to hear how you guys are thinking about that education process and your hypothesis to convince physicians to prescribe your software drug. <laughs> sure. We do believe education will be necessary. That's the case for any new therapy. Providers are not going to prescribe something that they don't understand. There will be an educational process. Providers are also not going to prescribe something that they don't understand the evidence in particular. So we will have to share our results, which we'll do broadly through peer review publications, through conferences and symposia, and other ways to reach providers and systems to educate providers about the effects and the safety profile of the therapy. And we'll also have to educate providers on the patient experience and how it works. But as a provider, we specifically design the software such that it is not critical for the provider to understand the, the inner workings, the algorithms, the feedback loops, all the intricacies of the app is not something that they would have to handle questions on or, or to even be intimately familiar with. But they have to understand the general constructs that this is something that is going to act like a form of CBT that is time limited, that they're not asking their patients to be on this for life. They're asking them to give it a shot for 90 days and to reevaluate glycemic control. That is exactly what they're doing right now. So they don't need to change anything. In their standard of care paradigm, when they start a new therapy, they reevaluate, decide if more is needed or a dose adjustment is necessary. So in many ways, we want to fit within the current care paradigm so that they don't have to make significant changes. And so alongside education, I think we also recognize that in the long run, we'll also have to help remove friction so that it is as easy to prescribe an app from an electronic health record as it is a pill. So that will be a critical piece of the puzzle. I think you bring up a good point, right? Because you as better cannot solve that alone, right? And hence kind of the Digital Therapeutic Alliance and many of the trailblazing companies solving a lot of that together. So I just wanted to comment for our listeners here. I agree. We imagine a future where there is a multitude of digital therapeutics out there. There is a marketplace for digital therapeutics and the infrastructure is being built, has to be built to afford easy prescription reimbursement, filling and the like. So this is something that we can't do alone. We're grateful that there are other trailblazing companies out there. And together, we believe that we can help support that necessary infrastructure. I think the last piece is in terms of your earlier question about the thesis is that providers, although it is easy to prescribe a pill, the reality is, is that providers have had access to dozens and dozens of effective pharmaceuticals, whether pills or injectables or insulin for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And these things work, but they come at a great cost in terms of actual costs, in terms of side effects, in terms of burden of care. And they're not working. They're simply not achieving the goal of helping patients achieve control. About 50% of patients in any one practice are not well controlled. And docs know, they're very aware that just adding another pill, another injectable to the mix is not a recipe for success. It contributes to polypharmacy. It has a whole host of problems. Our thesis is that many providers are looking for a way to offer their patients a non-pharmacological solution, one that doesn't come with all the side effects, and they just simply don't have the means to prescribe it. We expect that while education will be needed, while you know, we'll have to work on friction, ultimately uh, many providers will be excited by that opportunity because they also know what their patients prefer, and many patients also want to have an option to treat their condition without adding a fourth or fifth or sixth pill to the regimen. Absolutely. 
Now, I want to go to a, one of my favorite topics as a COO at Your Coach Health, which is a health coaching services company, ultimately. On your advisory board, you guys have the very famous Margaret Moore, at least famous in the health coaching circles, and would love to understand your hypothesis because you alluded to something earlier that physicians don't have the time. They have eight minutes to see the patient and to help the patient to work on their lifestyle modification, behavior change. And at your coach, we kind of say that health coaches are the front lines of behavior change. So we'd love to understand a little bit how you guys are thinking about it. And actually, just as a side, like how do you look at even from a clinical validation with or without health coach, the evidence generation around it? So I know it's a loaded question, but we'd love your thoughts on it. Oh, it's a great one. And we could talk on this for a long time. I had the pleasure of working with health coaches in the clinic for many years before joining Better Therapeutics. And so I was thrilled to see that Margaret Moore was one of our early advisors involved in the early years of the company. And as you mentioned, she's a pioneer and inspiring advocate, a force in the world of health coaching. At Better Therapeutics, we used health coaches, especially in the early days of the company, to supplement the tech that was immature. So it allowed us to hit the ground running to start working with patients really right away and to start doing feasibility studies where we paired health coaches with the early versions of the therapy, especially before the cognitive behavioral therapy component was fully built and embedded. And this gave us a really unique opportunity to be working with patients directly. As you mentioned, the health coaches are on the front line. They are wonderful advocates for patients, and they help us really get grounded in what the day-to-day -day life is a patient and what their struggles are and what their behavioral barriers are, and what are the strategies and tools that help patients overcome those barriers and leverage the strengths that they have as an individual. And so we were able to learn a lot from that experience. We were able to take that ethos of the health coach and really embed it in the software experience. Even though, you know, the main mechanism of action is cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of the user experience draws from the world of health coaching because we know it is so effective at allowing patients to preserve their autonomy, uh, to preserve their individuality, but helps them motivate themselves to make substantial changes. So there's health coaching in the ethos, but when it came to move progressively down the regulatory pathway, it became clear that you can't regulate a piece of software that has you know, an embedded human component. The FDA doesn't have jurisdiction. It's very difficult to generate an evidence base that physicians and, and regulators and payers can sort out when you have a human component. So it was really critical that ultimately we had developed the software to the point where it could stand alone without health coaching, without supplemental human support. So our Pivotal, for example, offers behavioral therapy in the digital form. It doesn't have any health coaching or any human support because we really need to demonstrate that the software alone is effective and is safe. And then when we commercialize it, you know, because we do have a deep experience here, it gives us the opportunity to develop, you know, a novel approach to patient services that also leverages the strengths of health coaches. And we can leverage the technology to understand the whole population that are using the digital therapy to understand which patients are predicted to do really well, which patients may benefit from more support. And it gives us the option then to leverage coaching or coaching-like modalities to offer support in a more scalable way or to train other systems how to do that as well. So, you know, we're excited about that as a part of our future, but I think important to stress that those health coaching elements are kind of brought in into the way we design the product and the software alone has to be evidence to be safe and effective without that wonderful support. Mark, as we're sort of wrapping up here, would love for you to give advice, ultimately, as a doctor yourself. Maybe uh, we can pick a doctor or an entrepreneur or even let's do a doctorpreneur that's trying to get into digital therapies, but would love your advice to that community, to those individuals. If I were to give any advice, I'd say that one important thing about being an entrepreneur as a medical provider it's critical to stay grounded in what's meaningful to you. 
You went into medicine to help people change lives and to make a difference. And your work as an entrepreneur is an opportunity to do exactly that. And it has to be grounded in what is meaningful to you, what's meaningful to the patients that, that you serve. And so I think in order to kind of maintain that connection with meaning, which you'll need to do because the path to bringing anything to market is fraught. It's a very difficult one. It's a very challenging one. It requires a long road and many problems to be solved. You need to be grounded in meaning and cultivate that meaning in your team. And one way to do that is to look for opportunities to engage with patients as early on as possible. To me, that's been one of the highlights of my time with Better Therapeutics. We didn't spend years and years in the lab working on theoretical stuff. We started working on something and we started bringing it to patients in, in early studies within the first year of our founding. And that meaningful experience has been very motivating and also very sustaining. To wrap up, and I think I know where you're going to go with this, we started with you and your personal story into the digital therapeutics world, and we want to end this episode with what gets you, Dr. Mark Berman, up in the morning? Well, the first thing that gets me up in the morning is my daughter, truth be told. I believe you only have one life to live, and if you have a chance to create something, and if you have a chance to create something that can create a positive change in the world... To me, that's what makes for a meaningful life. I go to work and I work hard because I think the chance to pursue that is very privileged and it's exciting to be able to think about the potential of spending your time and your energies in making the world a better place to whatever extent you can. Well, Mark, thank you very much for making the time. I am positive that our listeners will learn much from you and good luck with better and we'll keep an eye on BT001 and uh, more to come. Thanks, Eugene. Real pleasure being here. Thanks for tuning into the Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, a production of mission-based media. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player so you're automatically notified each time I speak with one of these amazing leaders and trailblazers who are forging the path for digital therapeutics. If you'd like to learn more about Your Coach Health or Health Excel, you can find the links to this and more in the show notes for this episode. I'm Eugene Borohovich, and catch you next time.